Okay, this is a lecture for my seventh hour U.S. history class on February 22nd. Anyway, have you heard of the story of uh, Icarus or Icarus? Have you ever heard that story? Anybody? Okay, well, yes? Yes. Good. Well, 3,000 years ago, Greeks told this story to their children. And it was about a man and his son. I'll just give you the brief, brief version of it. It was about a man and his son who had been had, had displeased the king, and so the king banished them off to an island. And there they were, separated from their homes, their families, on stuck on this little island. And they constantly thought about how do we escape. And they saw the seagulls flying, watching the birds fly. And they also noticed that the seagulls, when they flew, they dropped their feathers on the beach. And so they thought if we can get go to up here to these trees and build ourselves a frame and we attach those feathers to it with wax, then maybe we can fly like the birds and we can fly home. And so they did that and they tried and tried and tried and failed. But eventually it worked. They took off and they made several practice flights, but finally the day came when they were going to fly home. And just before they leaped off of that cliff to fly home, the father said to the son, be careful. He said, do not fly too close to the sun because if you do, it will melt the wax and your feathers will fall off and you'll crash into the sea and drown. And that kid, Icarus, 3,000, teenagers haven't changed in 10,000 years. Icarus, uh, you know, I <laughs> often tell students, I can take you to Pompeii outside the, the, the main Colosseum there and I can show you things that teenage boys wrote on the, uh, walls uh, on the walls and i will not repeat it here but it, it's not a bit different than what you see written in the boys bathroom you know and they did that too so teenagers never change you know you're not doing anything with all 16 year old excuse me teacher but i need the following students to go to the auditorium at this time what are they doing Caitlin Pennington, so Robinson, Ariana Rogers, Abby Savage, Brian Scarborough, Laura Wild Scarborough, Savannah Shaheen, Shelby Shaheen. Is this Savannah the juniors? Cicely yeah. Stevens, Courtney Taylor. Only Mike the juniors. Gunner Tillotson, Gavin Watkins, Jaden Watkins, Rashawn Watts, Avery Williams, Cameron Williams, Kiara Williams, Christopher Wheelis, Harris, Wingo, Prudence Yehola and Teresa Young Gilbert need to go to the auditorium. Anyway, this kid was just like you when your parents give you the car keys the first time. They tell you stop at every stop sign, don't speed, look twice, don't run any rain, all these instructions, and you're sitting there with your tongue hanging out of your mouth like a salivating dog. Just, look, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just give me the keys, give me the keys. They give you the keys. Off you go. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. And you're ignoring everything they told you. Well, this kid took off flying, and it was so exhilarating to be flying that he just flew closer and closer to his son, to the sun. His father yelled, Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. He got so close, the wax melted, the feathers fall off. He crashed into the sea, and poor little Icarus, or Icarus, however you want to put it, was dead. Okay, my point is this. 3,000 years, you know, people, human beings, I'll just put it to you this way, human beings have been trying, have been considering how do we fly? We want to leave the earth. We want to fly for 3,000 years before these two guys ever came along. They're the first people, the first humans ever uh, to fly. They were, get this down, bicycle, they owned a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. That's what the, their day job was. But... <clears throat> Their hobby was fly, trying to fly, build a plane that would fly. And by the way, at this time, and write this date down. This is the date I want you to remember, December 13, 1903. That's the first time that humans ever flew. <clears throat> so anyway, there were all sorts of people trying to rig up a, mach a machine, a plane that would fly. Uh, and when they had spare time for their bicycle shop, that's what they did. And they had built a plane. I want you to write down the name of the Wright Brothers, their plane. It's called the Flyer. Okay. And here is the Flyer. There it is. In fact, that's a picture of the first human flight ever right there. Uh, it had a 13 horsepower engine. It was a biplane. It had two sets of wings. The wings were 40 feet long. The plane itself, the body of the plane here was only 20, 
20 feet long. Uh, the pilot didn't sit up in it. He laid down, and there were two controls that he moved back and forth uh, like that. And they built this thing, and they took it down to a place, got this down. This is where the first human flight ever took place, Kitty Hawk. So you see it's out on the beach. There's the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. In fact, if you look at a North Carolina license plate, they usually have a sketch of that, the first flight, and it'll have North Carolina, and their state motto is first in flight. First, they want to remind everybody the very first flight of human beings took place in our state of North Carolina. What's Oklahoma's motto? The first man-made lake. That? No. What's oh, our license? What, what does it say on our license plate? Oklahoma is okay. Is that really good? I don't think so. It's okay. Like, that's what it says. That's what it says. Oklahoma is okay. We need to come oh, wow. Back. Our state is okay. Yeah. Oh, no. You know, we're just, oh, that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's not, it's anyway, that's another topic for another day. Anyway, they would go down to this beach, and this plane, by the way, as I say, had a 13-horsepower engine, uh, and the pilot laid down. And by the way, here, 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 I mean, if you want to see the real plane, that's just a, that's another plane flying, but there it is. That's in the American History Museum of the Smithsonian Institute. I'm going to take some of you follow students up there this summer. There's so many people. That's the real plane. That's not a model or a replica that they built from. That's it. And that's uh, that's a mannequin there. And that's Orville Wright. And that's exactly how he made the first flight of history. But there are so many people. I forget how many million want to go in and see that plane. And it's really interesting. But you have to walk around. And, and you can't stop moving. You know, you know, the whole time you just have to sort of be shuffling your feet, but you can go around as many times as you want to. But there it is. That's that's the flyer, okay? And uh, on this particular day, it's the wintertime, December 17, 1903, they had tried that morning to get the plane up for three three times. And you can see from this uh, picture here, not that one, but you can see that it was a cold, raw, cloudy, misty winter day. And they had tried three times, and the thing hadn't flown and so they said well it was getting to be about 12 o'clock and they said we're going to go eat lunch but just before we go eat lunch we're going to try one more time if it doesn't fly we're just going to pack it in and have a barn or something we're going to put it in the barn and we'll come back down the next time we get a chance and continue to try and fly but just in case it did fly every time they tested it because both of those guys both of the Wright brothers uh, did I give you their names Wilbur and Orville okay both of Wilbur and Orville if the, when the thing finally flew, they wanted to be the first person to fly. And so they flipped the coin, and on this fourth try, Orville won. And, and there you see him laying down. And that time, and on the fourth try, on December 13th, 1903, it flew. Okay, it flew. And by the way, get this down. The first flight lasted 59 seconds. 59 seconds. And the plane flew 852 feet, which is down that beach, which is, which is about a half a mile. Okay. Did you say 50 seconds? It lasted 59 seconds. 59 seconds. And uh, the plane flew 852 feet, like I say, which is about a half, a half a mile. 66 years later, and that's just one lifetime, 66 years later, in August, get this down, in August of 1969, Men walked on the moon. Men, we haven't been back. No, but we're the only nation. There's one flag on the moon today. It's the U.S. flag. It's sticking straight out. No gravity. It's sticking just straight out. That's planted on the moon, and there's a brass plaque there that says in August, of, roughly this, in August of 1969, uh, men from the earth came here in peace. Uh, the Russians said, well, we'll put a man on the moon. Uh, the closest they ever came is they fired a rocket that hit the moon and it exploded. The Chinese said, we're going to put a man on the moon. They never have yet. And we're about to put a one man on the moon because we're now, and it may happen this summer. I need to check up on that, but we're, we're about ready to send another uh, group of astronauts to the moon. And this time I think they may all be women. Okay. We've had a man on the moon. This may all be women. Okay. But my point is the beginning of this, the first people to conquer space are Wilbur and Orville Wright. And they did it in 1903. That's a little bit beyond the Gilded Age, but it's pretty pretty darn close, okay? Well, get this down. Not a, so you've got all these inventions during the Gilded Age, and not only did these inventions make life easier, people didn't have to work 
as hard. Uh, the work day, get this down, the work day was shortened. You know, people, now they still worked. I mean, if, if we went back and had to work like they did, it would kill us. But they still worked very, very hard, but not as hard. And I'm speaking in broad general terms today, okay? But my point is this. By the end of the Gilded Age, well, the middle of the Gilded Age, by 1880, more and more Americans were finding, get this down, more and more that they had that wonderful thing called leisure time. That's time that you have really nothing to do. And if you give a human, if you, usually if you give people leisure time, just a period that they don't have much to do, they will find something to occupy their time. And what is it that they found to occupy their time uh, in the middle of the Gilded Age, which is a multi-trillion dollar industry today? Alcohol. What? Sports. Sports. Write this down. Well, you know, they've been, people have been consuming alcohol long before the Gilded Age. That's, you know, that's a standard. One of the first things humans did when they created civilization 10,000 years ago, they started brewing alcohol. They might have been brewing alcohol before they created an alphabet. I don't know. But anyway, drinking is a long, long... No, get this down. They invented college and professional sports. You know, I told you a long time ago when we started talking about the Gilded Age. Pardon? Uh, the Gilded Age. And it isn't just this long period of history long ago that has nothing to do with today. I told you that almost everything that you see going on in society today, right now in 2023, is a direct byproduct of the Gilded Age. And here's a perfect example. You know, are uh, we obsessed with sports today? Here we are in the shadow of the, the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, we have right now, we're basketball fans are looking uh, forward to March, March Madness, college and professional sports. And they are multi-trillion dollar industries today. A lot of money changes hands in sports. This uh, Patrick Mahomes, is it Mahome? I don't get H O M E. How much does he make a year? What do they pay him to go around and throw a, a leather ball? What, what do they pay him to, to play a boys' game? That's what it is. <coughs> How much? Seventy million? Did you say? Or seven million? Seven? Okay. Well, millions, millions, and millions and millions of dollars. These professional. So, so you know, uh, it's a major college and professional sports, a major industry. Well, get this down. Let's talk about the. Uh, by the way, what do you think the most popular sport of the Gilded Age was? Football. No. Football. No. Baseball. baseball. Write that down. In fact, uh, it is during the Gilded Age that baseball became known as America's pastime. Okay, America's pastime. America's pastime. What does that mean? Uh, it was America's what? Favorite sport. That's what America's pastime. Now, by the way, is it America's pastime today? What is? What is the, huh? Is it, pro or college? College. It's not March Madness. It's not basketball coming up. People are, people are pretty crazy about that here in a few weeks. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think it's probably college football. That's just a guess. It's not baseball anymore, but get this down. From, from the Gilded Age up through the 1960s, baseball was America's number one sport. It had a greater fan following than uh, any, any other sport. Uh, baseball came from an English game called Rounders. You know, uh, baseball has been played for the last 500 years. Uh, it originated in England. There was a game called Rounders. Rounders had four bases, nine players. They had a leather-covered ball. Uh, there was a guy with a stick, and you tried to hit the leather-covered ball, and you scored by running around the bases. If that ain't baseball, I'll eat that hat over there. That's baseball. But they didn't call it that. They called it rounders. In fact, the very first person to ever call baseball baseball was an English poet. I guess he played rounders and really loved the game, and he wrote a poem about it in 1744, and that was the first time – that it was ever referred to as the game of baseball, okay? Look, the pilgrim, you remember the pilgrims, the turkey people, the first thing, when they came here, their children, their children played uh, rounders, okay? George Washington's army during the Revolutionary War played rounders during the Civil, by the time of the Civil War, it was called baseball. Both sides took time out 
to play to play uh, baseball. And in 1876, got this now. By the way, what other great events taking place in 1876 besides? I've got a lot of questions for you. Uh, what great event was that shocked the nation took place in eight? Well, that's a lot. Of, well, you can give me two answers on that. And we've talked about what a great event that shocked the nation took place in 1876. Was it the indoor? What did you say? Indoor. Wait, was that earlier? Indoor toilet? No. Or was that before? Oh, those were coming online. I didn't. Oh. What did you say? Well, somebody said something over here. No, it wasn't sports wise. There is something sports wise, but I haven't talked about it yet. But I'm talking about something else that happened outside the sports world. What? Uh, no. The Civil War ended in 1865. You need to learn that. We've said that a thousand times. 1861 to 65. It'd be awful to get through an American history course. Listen, it would be listen, it'd be awful to get through an American history course and get credit for it, and you don't even know when the Civil War happened. 1861 to 65. Yeah. But this was after the Civil War. It's 1876. Yeah. A light bulb. What? A light bulb. Well, the Industrial Revolution certainly is happening. That's true. Okay. But it shocked the country. They couldn't believe it had happened. TV. No, oh, wait, no, 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 no television in here until the until the nineteen nineteen fifties. Okay, so yeah, Custer's Last Stand, Battle of Little Bighorn. We talked about that. That was a real shocker. The American Army went marching off, and the Sioux and the Cheyenne wiped them out. Boy, that shook the country. Something else that happened in eighteen. I don't know if we talked about this in eighteen. Have we talked about Alexander Graham Bell? Have we talked about Well, we will. He invented telephone. Well, that's a big deal. You know, you couldn't live without it. Uh, did we talk about that? Uh, you said it later. Did I show, huh? You said it later. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Our first conversation, Mr. Watson, come here, I need you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a pretty big deal, too. But the big deal, 1876. But in 1876, while Custer's taking it on the chin out there at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in Montana, get this down. How many, how many, let me ask you, how many leagues are there in baseball? 30, I'm not asking teams. I'm talking about leagues. A group of teams forms a league. No? What? Well, which is it? Two or three? Two. Okay, what are they? The American League? Are any of you baseball people? The American League and the National League. And, you know, every year in October, there's an event called the World Series. I was shocked. Talking about shock. I asked the class, what is the World Series? Either they were just not in the mood to answer, or they, no, we don't know. Uh, there are two leagues the American League. Can anybody name me an American League team? Um, was in the Los Angeles um, Angels. Well, it's not the Los, the, uh, Los Angeles Dodgers. Yeah. They're a National League team. Can you name me an American League team? So the Yankees. The Yankees. Another one would be. The Texas Rangers, maybe you go down and watch them play down in Arlington. Another National League team would be the Atlanta Braves. Another American League team would be the Boston Red Sox, the Baltimore Orioles. And every year, the best team in each league, they meet in October, and they play an event, seven games called the World Series. And the first one, and you rarely ever go seven games, the first team to win four games, that's the majority, they're the world champions in baseball. That's just a little baseballology for you, okay? Well, baseball was the number one sport in America during uh, the uh, during the Gilded Age. It became that. And in 1876, get this down, the National League was formed. And in 1882, the American League was formed. What's that? 1876. Custer, 1876. Well, he's getting killed out there back east. Huh? And when was the American League? 1882. And the first World Series, I just told you what a World Series is, get this down, was in 1903. Okay, they played a long time before they had a World Series. And just for the record, you don't have to write this down. I'm just using this to illustrate my point. Just for the record, in the first World Series, it was Boston versus Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was the National League. 
the Boston Red Sox, to call them today. In those days, they called them the Boston Red Stockings. But anyway, the Boston Red Stockings in 1903 took on Pittsburgh, and Boston won. And then Boston won again in 1912. And the Boston fans were so happy that their team had won two World Series that they built them a brand new, beautiful stadium. And there's Yankees. Look at that. That's the early New York Yankees. Easy way to remember this. Good. There's an early Boston team. Evil. <laughs> Let's go back. Good. <laughs> Evil. In fact, write this down. The New York Yankees are the greatest team in the history of the universe. Write that down. They are the greatest baseball team. How many World Series? Which team has won the most World Series? New York. New York. How many World Series do you think they've won? How much? About 11. 11 or more. 28. Coach Green is a Boston Red Sox fan. That proves that when he was a little baby, somebody dropped him on his head. <laughs> but, I'll tell, but I'll tell you, no, but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. His great great grandchildren will be working on their third set of teeth by the time Boston ties the New York Yankees in number of series one. You go ask him that. We talk about that all the time. Evil. <laughs> Good. Okay. But these evil people here won two World Series, and by 1912, their fans were so happy that they built them, and that's Fenway Park. Write that down, Fenway Park. You ought to know a little bit about the All-American Games Hall Baseball. Fenway, F-E-N-W-A-Y, F-E-N-W-A-Y, Fenway Park. Built them that in 1912. Look at Fenway. And, and by the way, this has this been there since 1912. It's the oldest active baseball field in America. And it's unique in this sense that they have, look out here at the outfield fence. If you're down here batting, looking out the left field, the fence is higher in left field than on the rest of the field. It's an accomplishment to knock one over center field, but it's really something to knock it over this wall here. And that wall, what's that called? The Green Monster. You ever hear the Green Monster in, in baseball? It's in the Boston Red Sox Park. In Boston, they were so they won in 1912, built a new stadium. Then they won again in 1918. Boston said, "Boy, we're really on a roll. We're going to dominate this game called baseball." And in 1918, when they won, okay, there was a player in on Boston's team. He played center field and he played, pitched once in a while. He was a relief pitcher. And the New York Yankees wanted that. Nobody ever heard of that kid. The New York Yankees wanted that kid really, really bad. And, you know, in baseball, they trade players, okay? And so the New York Yankee organization said to the Boston organization, we want that guy. What will you take for him in the trade? And they said, well, you've got two guys on your team that we want. And so they made the deal in 1918. And this young player that no one really ever heard of that played for Boston now became a New York Yankee. And I'll show you his picture if I can. No, maybe not. Let's see. There. Who's that? That's George Herman Root. Okay. Write him down. George Herman Root. Who was called the Bay. I would be shocked. I would be shocked to find anybody that had never heard of Babe Ruth. And I would be shocked to find anyone that didn't know he was a baseball player. Now, they might know, not know anything else about him. He said, you know, he, he held the home run record until 1974. We'll talk all about him later when we talk about the 1920s. But, you know, he's arguably, he, he, well, you know, you can argue about if he's the greatest player. I don't think he's the, anymore. I don't think he could compete with these athletes today. Maybe he could. You know, he's, in the dugout, he ate hot dogs and smoked cigarettes and drank beer, you know, so he'd have to, you know, shape up. But he may not be the greatest baseball player anymore, but he's the best known, Babe Ruth. And you know what? Boston traded him. In 1918, when is the next time Boston won a World Series? Anybody want to guess? It's pretty close. They didn't win another World Series until 2004. That's 86 years. 
Go up, to Fen go up to Fenway Park and sit down next to one of those Boston fans and say, hey, I'm from Oklahoma. I don't know a lot about this game. But can you tell me anything about the curse of the Bambino? That's what they call it. Boston fans say the biggest mistake we ever saw, ever made was trading Babe Ruth because then Babe Ruth goes on and he becomes, well, in his day, he was the greatest baseball player probably uh, and would rank pretty close to that even today. The curse the curse of the Bambino, Fenway Park. By the way, you all know who the first African-American was to play Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. Write that down. 1946, Jackie. 1946, long after the Gilded Age, Jackie Robinson. Which team did Jackie play for? Wasn't it the Dodgers? He played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. They were in Brooklyn then. But, yeah, and maybe he still was playing the and then when you get all that written down, scratch a line through it because it's not true. Jackie Robinson, I don't get no, Oh, no, don't tell us that. Oh, no. I'll show you. That man right there, get him down. He's the first African-American to play baseball. And he played baseball 70 years, 60 years before Jackie Robinson. Moses Fleetwood Walker in the Gilded Age. Jackie Robinson played in the 20th century. He played in the 19th. He was a catcher. For a team called the Toledo Blue Stockings. Now, they no longer exist, but they were an American League professional team in his day. That is the first African American ever to play um, professional baseball. In 1884, Jackie Robinson doesn't play baseball until 1946. Okay? 1884. Get this man down. Dr. James Naismith. What, which game did he invent? Uh, That's like basketball. Get this down. Dr. Naismith, write him down. He was a very busy man. James Naismith was a very busy man. Uh, he first got a degree in PE. He was a PE teacher. And then he got a medical, he became a medical doctor. And then he became a Presbyterian minister. Okay, so he has quite an accomplished life. Yeah, he did all that. How, I don't know, but he did all that. But his first job out of college was to... Uh, for the it was in, in Boston, Massachusetts, or maybe it was Springfield. Anyways, in Massachusetts, and the YMCA. You know what that is? A young man's Christian association. It was just sort of a club for young men, kind of almost an after-school program. And they put him in charge of all these teenage boys. Teenage boys, having been one myself many years ago, I can testify that teenage boys should never be left on their own without supervision. Ladies, you can. I can take all of them. No, we didn't. I can take all of them and I can leave you in here and I'll come back and everything will be reasonably okay. I can take all of you and leave them in here. When I came back, the doors would be off their hinges and the light bulbs would be unscrewed. Sorry, gentlemen, that's just the way it is. You're going to grow up someday, but they're going to be, they always beat us to the mark. Anyway, he had all these boys and in the summertime and spring and fall, the weather was nice. He could take them outside. They could run around and get rid of all that excess energy. But in Massachusetts, the winters are long and they're cold. And when winter came, they had to stay in a one building. And those boys were got bored, took them about that long, and they started unscrewing the light bulbs. They started tearing the place down. So his director came to him and said, Naismith, I'm going to give you two weeks. That's 14 days. you got to come up with some kind of game to occupy these boys' time. And... Uh, in two weeks, get this down, he wrote 13 rules, and that's where the game of basketball came from. And that's an early day basketball gym there. He uh, hangs up a peach basket. At first, they didn't take the bottom out of the peach basket. They had to have a ladder beside it. And by the way, they didn't have a goal at, with, at each end of the court. There was just one peach. It's kind of like playing out in your carport, you know. Uh, to, uh, and every time they'd shoot, when somebody scored, they had to get up on the ladder and toss the ball back out into play. And then somebody went, well, duh, you know, what if we cut the bottom out of the basket? And then somebody said, well, gee, what if we put another basket down at the other end? And along with his uh, 13 rules uh, was born the game of uh, basketball. And like I say, that's a pretty big deal. I don't happen to be a basketball fan myself, but that's a pretty big deal. Coming up, uh, this country's going to go about half nuts here in about 20 days or so during March, March Madness, Okay. Uh, he actually got hired uh, as the coach up at Kansas, University of Kansas, okay? University of Kansas, pretty prominent in basketball. 
yeah, they're to basketball what Alabama is to college football right now. Uh, and uh, he's buried up there in Lawrence, Kansas. He's buried up there. I've never been up there, but he's buried in Lawrence, Kansas. You've never been up there? Hmm? To like as a trip? Well, I've just never been to Lawrence. Okay. I've never been to Lawrence. But uh, been to Kansas State, but I've never been to never been to Lawrence, Kansas. Anyway, I don't really feel like I've missed much, but I've never been up there. Anyway, any of you from Kansas, sorry. First college football game, get this down. First college football game, 1869, four years after the Civil War. And you don't have to write this down, but it was Princeton versus Rutgers. And Rutgers won that game six to four. What does that sound like, six to four? Sounds like a what? Basketball. Baseball, did you say? Basketball. Yeah. Uh, that sound like basketball. No, not basketball. Usually basketball is up to the 80s, 70s. Yeah, this, this sounds just like baseball, six to four. Students have often asked me, well, how did they arrive at that score? And my answer to those students is I've never been interested enough to look it up. <laughs> uh, you can look that up, and, you know, if you'll tell me, I'll jot it down in my notes here, but it was, it was six to four. Uh, get this down. Early day football was a violent game, okay? There's football, by the way. Look at that monster. Okay. Much bigger than yours. See that guy right there? He's all ready to go out and play. It's the only pads he has. No helmet. But listen, quickly. Is this the seventh hour? Yeah. Okay. Well, time flies. Uh, listen, from 1900, write this down. I must say it's a violent game. From 1900... Until 1905, 45 college football players were killed during the game. We just had an incident in professional football where this young player, I think he's 24 years old, what's his name? Um, I don't keep up with pro ball. Football, huh? Yes, yeah, Who? What? Demar Hamlin. Hamlin? Yeah. He hit, and that literally, I mean, that could happen to you. You could be in a car wreck and strike the steering wheel and have a massive heart attack. Uh, and that's, I think, what happened to him. Yeah. But thankfully, you know, he's recovered. And, uh, they were but, him on the field. Huh? The paramedics on the field, like, fell him back. Saved his life, yeah. Well, listen, that was on every news broadcast. Ever. And that's one person, and he didn't die, thankfully. Think about this. What if in the next five years, during the college football season, 45 players got killed? It would get me. Huh? Well, how perceptive you're ahead of the game because guess what? There was a call. You know, a lot of parents today are saying, we're not going to let our kids play football because of the concussion issue. In 1905, get this down, they wanted to ban the game. And it's pretty much just a miracle that you can sit down and watch a good college football game today. But when we come back tomorrow, we'll talk about the president who saved football. I think I know who it is. Who would you guess? I bet you do. I really like my name like that. I remember saying it though.